I pity a country that uh, would come up against us. Um, the synergy with air, land, and sea forces and, uh, and our ability to control the battle space and seize the high ground is devastating. All countries respect the power of the United States and they respect uh, how dominant we are in this region. And we get better and better and better. Tonight at 10, a rare glimpse of China's ambitious expansion in one of the world's most contested regions. We report from the South China Sea, where the Chinese are warning off anyone who comes too close to their building program. We continue our look this morning at what China does not want you to see. The United States says the superpower is reclaiming land in the South China Sea. The fact that we're dealing with a situation right now where we, the U.S., has to be much more aggressive in dealing with the Chinese government. CNN has learned that the U.S. Navy is about to send a destroyer there. Let's go to our CNN chief. CNN got exclusive access to classified U.S. surveillance flights over the islands. The threat of China is becoming big news. The media is beating the drums of war as the world is being primed to regard China as a new enemy. China's alarming creation of entirely new territory in the South China Sea is one part of a broader military push that some fear is to challenge U.S. dominance in the region. China is building airstrips in the South China Sea on disputed islands condemned by an international tribunal. This is now a flashpoint for war between China and America. What is not news is that China itself is under threat. These American bases form a giant noose encircling China with missiles, bombers, warships, all the way from Australia through the Pacific to Asia and beyond. I mean, if you were in Beijing looking out, you stood on the tallest building in Beijing and looked out at the Pacific Ocean, you'd see American warships. You'd see Guam is about to sink because there's so many missiles pointed at China. You'd look up at Korea and see American armaments pointing at China. You'd see Japan, which is basically, uh, uh, Japan's a glove over the American fist. I think if I was Chinese, I'd have a little to worry about, about American aggressiveness. And we have China surrounded, uh, and we're doing more all the time to try and keep it surrounded and deepen that containment of China. Uh, but China presents a fascinating case of a country that is independent, doesn't have foreign bases on its territory, uh, growing very rapidly, not as rapidly now as it did for 30 years, but still uh, the second-ranking economy in the world. We have an adversary. And that adversary is China. And that adversary, uh, unless there is dramatic reform inside China, will be our enemy someday. One myth um, I think really that needs to be dispelled was that somehow China is aiming to replace America and, and, and going to run the world. <laughs> mm. it's not, well, first of all, the Chinese are not that stupid. The, the West, with its Christian uh, roots are about converting other people into their beliefs. The Chinese are not about that. It's it's just the I'm, I again I'm not degrading the Western culture. I'm just pointing out the inherent nature, the DNA is of two different cultures. The Chinese two thousand years ago built the Great Wall to keep the barbarians out, not to invade them. As the world's economic power moves rapidly to Asia. The response of the United States is to deploy the majority of its naval forces to Asia and the Pacific. This massive military buildup is known in Washington as the pivot to Asia. The target is China. The great power game in the 21st century is called perpetual war. America's unchallenged arms industry, the annual prize is huge profits from almost $600 billion of military spending. 
once an imaginary weapon on Star Wars, the electromagnetic gun is now reality. You're sitting there thinking about these next generation and futuristic ideas, and we've got scientists who have designed these, and it's coming to life. And the smartest weapons need enemies. As a Pacific nation, the United States will play a larger and long-term role in shaping this region and its future. I have directed my national security team to make our presence and mission in the Asia-Pacific a top priority. In one sense, is the U.S. already at war with China? Yes, on the ground and in the air. The winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, President Barack Obama, has committed to trillions of dollars of uh, to our nuclear arsenal. He's committing trillions of future dollars to war and space. And we need an enemy for all this money, and China's the perfect enemy. The aim of this film is to break a silence. The United States and China may well be on a path to war, and nuclear war is no longer unthinkable. In a few years, China has become the world's second biggest economic power. The United States is the world's biggest military power, with bases and missiles and ships covering every continent, every ocean. China is a threat to this dominance, says Washington. But who is the threat? This film is about shifting power and great danger. It's also a film about the human spirit and the rise of an extraordinary resistance among people on the front line of a coming war, where the words never again have an urgent meaning for all of us. This is Bikini, the rim of an ancient underwater volcano in the Marshall Islands. With its necklace of 23 islands, Bikini is a place of beauty and silence and menace. Look closely where the Emerald Lagoon suddenly falls into a vast black hole. This is the crater of one of the greatest man-made explosions, the hydrogen bomb they call Bravo. It vaporized an entire island and poisoned almost everything and everyone. As our plane flew low, we seemed to touch its deathly void. The Marshall Islands lie in the vast Pacific Ocean between the United States and Asia. Captured from the Japanese in World War II, they've long been America's strategic secret, its stepping stone to Asia and China. People here sustain themselves for thousands of years with abundant fish breadfruit and coconuts. They were skilled navigators who sailed by the stars. Westerners might call this paradise. All that changed in 1946 when the United States took over the Marshall Islands as a trust territory with an obligation to protect the health and well-being of the people. A nightmare began. The islands were turned into a laboratory for the testing of nuclear weapons and the people into guinea pigs. Crossroads, scene 24, take two. In this propaganda film, now, the Bikini okay. Islanders are being we, deceived. We Unknown to them, plans were already underway to destroy their paradise forever. Will you ask King Judah 
that the United States government now wants to attempt to turn this great destructive force into something good for mankind and that these experiments here at Bikini are the first step in that direction. Tell him that's fine. Everything being in God's hands, it must be good. Eighty-seven ships take positions three miles off Bikini to suffer the shattering impact of the fifth atomic bomb. Here will be An armada of warships was assembled in Bikini Lagoon in order to blow them to bits. The decks of the 73 test ships anchored in Bikini Lagoon are scenes of feverish activity as scientists plot experimental programs designed to furnish data on blast effects of the mighty atom bomb. Animals of many Animals were strapped to their decks like a perverse Noah's Ark. The experiment was to see how they died, how they burned. Special ointments are applied to determine their protective quality. Other parts of the exposed areas being left bare to the atom blast. Three, two, one, zero. green <laughs> Being on Bikini today is disturbing ghosts. I struggle through the jungle to the bunker where they press the button at 6.45 on the morning of the H-bomb test. Now claimed by the undergrowth, it's like a subterranean temple to modern times. They drank milk made powdered milk, smoked Lucky Strike cigarettes, and later this sign was erected that's beyond irony. It says, please leave this property as you find it. Thank you for your kindness and understanding. The Mamsells give their all for their art, and you can just bet that audience is giving with the wolf calls. The Bikini, named after the atomic explosion in the Pacific. The Bikini was an explosion everywhere. In 1946, the Bikini Swim Soup was launched to celebrate the nuclear explosions that had destroyed life on Bikini Island. The inventor of the Bikini, a Frenchman, made his fortune. Today, a bikini body is promoted in magazines as an object of desire and good health. The bodies of the people of bikini and other islands are the most irradiated in the world. All these women have had thyroid cancer. <laughs> I 
men go poda go wandel tak yenga lelo pin po bu bukem yang tu ca po bu apo da bang ai jo para em po bu po bu me don do orang ai bara lagi lebe ali un cetra na kala kargo de la el ngar mi gerar tem da rar ta iria ilo po ngone o ajri ro rar dari yang menang teriu era rar pa na me Today, bikini is unfit for human life. Radiation poisons the food and water. Our shoes registered unsafe on a Geiger counter. The abandoned cemetery looks out to where the sun rose one morning, then rose again as apocalypse. The equivalent of one Hiroshima bomb was exploded in these islands every day for 12 years a scar beauty has returned to the island but the people have it exiled to barren islands many of them starved in 1968 president lyndon johnson told them it was safe to go home but it wasn't safe and the us authorities knew it wasn't safe i jala ga minin yamar ga rar ga mane ngane ay chep accident ak lukun molin ga rar rar do godin ko kore ijin ya ene ga ene im ingie un nair do gom eno program ga rar do kan ga rar na ka ka ga yo jongan an cherwal pay ni pen ak ga gar jawab accident man ne What happened as a result of the Bravo test was that a cover-up was launched very shortly after March 1. I mean there's such a history of wrong information, outright lies, deception. There was no no attempt to take the most conservative approach and make sure that everybody was okay. They knew where the radioactive fallout was going to go. Uh and they took that risk and went ahead and detonated the bomb knowing full well which way it was going to go uh they still had an opportunity to uh, evacuate even on the day of the shot but these people were not evacuated we were not evacuated and the people on Utrecht were not evacuated so it only leads one one up uh one to believe that uh, number one the united states needed some guinea pigs to study what the uh the effects of radiation would do and uh, that that's a pretty strong indication that the united states knew that it seems extraordinary here we are this far into the 21st century talking to people still frightened of all that nuclear fallout all those tests all those years ago the impression i get is that there's so little trust among people the us is trying to provide as much information as much good information as we can yeah. And so I wouldn't accept the characterization that uh that there've been lies and and cover-ups. The word guinea pigs comes up a lot from these survivors. I would I would refer you to our embassy website on that. I've read it. And yes. uh that that question was looked at during the Clinton administration and that was oh. not the conclusion they came to. The secret of the Marshall Islands is project 4.1. declassified documents reveal a scientific program that began as a study of mice and became a study of human beings exposed to radiation Chicago is where it all began and to the AEC Argonne Labs in Chicago last week came seven men natives of the Marshall Islands Levin is from Ohio he and the rest were irradiated by our March 1954 hydrogen bomb test John is mayor of Rongola, which is 100 miles from Bikini. John, as we said, is a savage, but a happy, amenable savage. His grandfather ran almost naked on his coral atoll. The white man brought money and religion and a market for his copra. John reads, knows about God, and is a pretty good mayor. The Iron Room is a radiation detector for human beings. Inside John the mayor whose first visit to the white man's country meant San Francisco cable cars and Chicago skyscrapers and streamlined trains whose first visit to the white man's country meant the iron room 
A savage governs his life by ritual. And he understands this because he thinks of it as a new ritual. Sitting alone inside the room. Outside, a strange kind of priest in a long white coat. When the ritual of the Iron Room was over for John, it began for the others. As each finished, he was told it was over, and he was given apples and other good things to eat. Then he took off the ritual clothing, and the seven men put on the suits and top coats they had been lent in Hawaii, which they would return in Hawaii on their way back in the Marshall Islands, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. United States government documents clearly demonstrate that its scientists conducted human radiation experiments with Marshallese citizens. Some of our people were injected with or coerced to drink fluids laced with radiation. Other experimentation involved the purposeful and premature resettlement of people on islands highly contaminated by weapons tests to study how human beings absorb radiation from their foods and environment. These people are guinea pigs. They are part of the experiment Project 4.1. They're being returned to Rongelap, an island a hundred miles from Bikini by the US Navy. They were told repeatedly it was safe to go home. This happy couple believed they were going home to safety. The man is John Anjane, the mayor of Rongelap, the happy savage from the Iron Room in Chicago. His wife is Majua, and this is their baby son, Lekoj. They had no idea of the horror that lay ahead. They are being returned to an island described by a U.S. atomic energy official as by far the most contaminated place on Earth. He added, it will be interesting to get a measure of human uptake when people live in a contaminated environment. The people of Rongelap remained on their poison island for 28 years as guinea pigs, the objects of regular scientific examination. The islanders pleaded with the U.S. authorities to move them to safety as evidence emerged that the second generation, the children, were also poisoned. Desperate to leave, the islanders called on Greenpeace to rescue them. This ship, the Rainbow Warrior, moved the entire population to an uncontaminated island. They called it Operation Exodus. <laughs> This is Dr. Robert Connor, a leading medical scientist of Brookhaven National Laboratories. Connor devoted his distinguished career to examining the islanders.
He wrote, the habitation of these people on the island will afford the most valuable ecological radiation data on human beings. The various radioisotopes present can be traced from the soil to the food chain and into human beings. Dr. Connard gained the trust of whole communities. When he brought the islanders to New York to be examined, he showed them the sights and had them over for a barbecue. When John Anjane's son Lekaj died, aged 18, Dr. Connard sent the man they called a savage a sympathy card from your friend, Bob. In 1957, Majua Anjain was the smiling young woman seen here on her way back to Rongelap, unaware of the danger she and her family faced. This is Majua 28 years later grieving the death of her son, Lekoj, from radiation poisoning. Like her son and her husband, Majua died from a virulent cancer. I don't see any great clinics that have been established by, if not the Department of Energy, certainly not by the US government. Uh, in, there's a clinic downtown in Mount Uh There's also a whole, whole body counter. You can have the plutonium in your body measured as well. Anyone can for free. This is the plutonium measuring shop where they'll tell you how radioactive you are. People waiting to be tested are welcome with a video showing their islands being blown up. And this reassuring commentary. Yahweh Kong Aulip, Etain Bill Jackson, program manager of the Department of Energy, DOE Marshall Islands Program. This is Rinnock, a refugee from the poisoned island of Rongelap, whose family owned land and lived a secure, prosperous life. Now she lives in a shack in the capital, Majuro, with her children and grandchildren. She has no water, no sanitation. <laughs> And power, she has electricity. In 
the United States granted limited independence to the Marshall Islanders on condition that they accepted a mere $150 million compensation for the damage caused by nuclear testing. A claims tribunal was set up and soon ran out of money. An appeal to the U.S. Congress more than a decade ago still awaits a reply. Darlene Keju Johnson was a young health worker who became the champion of her people after she discovered the full extent of their suffering caused by nuclear testing that many more islands were poisoned than the Americans claimed. This remarkable speech in 1983 broke the silence. I bring greetings from the Marshall Islands and throughout Micronesia. We have hundreds of women who have miscarriages. We have leukemia cancers. We have thyroid cancers. We have stillbirth babies. We have nowadays, I just come back from home, and I have talked to many women and men in the population, is that we have babies we call jellyfish babies. A baby is born on a labor table, and it moves up and down like this. It's a colorful, ugly thing. It does not shape like a human being. It moves up and down like this on a labor table because that thing is breathing. That is a baby. In 1982, Darlene married Gift Johnson, the author of this tribute to his wife. Darlene was one of the liveliest, most entertaining individuals that uh, I have ever had the pleasure of knowing. She was a voice for the voiceless. Like so many Marshall Islanders, Darlene died of cancer, age 45. This is the largest of the islands, Kwajalein, occupied by one of America's most important and secretive bases. Known as the Ronald Reagan test site, it's a missile launch pad that commands the Pacific Ocean all the way to Asia and China. Here, the people of the Marshall Islands are once again being subjected to the testing of weapons of mass destruction designed for a coming war. The base is part of a remarkable plan known as Vision 2020. Devised in the 1990s, its aim is described officially as full spectrum dominance. This means control of all land Sea, air, cyberspace, and space. Five, four, three, two, one. Ignition. From California, almost 5,000 miles away, the U.S. Air Force tests its intercontinental missiles by firing them at the Marshall Islands. Imagine a missile coming screaming out of the sky. Uh, it, it's absolutely terrifying. There, I think that there's there's really nothing that that I can imagine that that would be more terrifying than this. And and we're talking about uh, devices that any one of them could go off course. None of this disturbs life on the base, where small town America has been recreated, a wonderland of the suburban good. Thank you. Thank you. Fabulous. But there's nothing better than living on a tropical island. I pretty much have beachfront property, you know? It's great. I love it here.
just across the bay is Ebai Island. Known as the slum of the Pacific, more than 12,000 people live here on a strip of land less than a mile long. Many of them refugees from what is now the missile base and from islands poisoned by nuclear testing. Every day, people from Ebai are brought to work on the missile base to water the gardens and the golf course. Then they are ferried back to their poverty. This is apartheid in the Pacific. If I need a lot of things. What? Medicine, Getting medicine, education, and job. Vegetable and fruits. Vegetable and fruits? Yes. Here we are, it's a tropical island, and you need vegetable and fruit. Yes. Fish, vegetables, and fruit were once abundant on Ebai. Today, fish is contaminated by toxic pollutants says the Environmental Protection Agency. Now the only food most people can afford is processed and imported. They have the highest rate of diabetes in the world. When someone gets really ill, do they go to the hospital over on the base because they've got a pretty modern clinic over there. They don't treat, treat them with medicine. They just go there for taking the blood yeah. and then x-ray. So what happens when somebody is seriously ill? They cannot do anything. The most consistent example given is the example of the Ronald Reagan missile site and Ebi next mm. to it. On the Ronald Reagan missile site, there's a vivid example of the United States, golf courses and uh, uh, swimming pools and all kinds of amenities. Um, right next to it is what is called the slum of the Pacific. It's a, it's a challenge. Ebay uh, is in great need right now. We've talked about infrastructure. One of the projects the US is working with our Australian colleagues and with the Asia mm. Development Bank is a sewer and water project desperately needed for Ebi. Ebi is overcrowded, uh, the schools need repair. Actually, the US military did a survey back in the 70s mm. and found that the sewers didn't work and the water didn't run and the electricity wasn't there. It only happened not all that long ago. They found almost exactly the same thing. Why, why hasn't that been fixed? We've, there's complete agreement that Ebi mm. should be a priority and not only because of the the current activities of the Ronald Reagan Space and Missile Defense Site. Mm. But there's also now an additional uh, component mm. that is providing for global security, and that's the Space Fence Project by the mm. Air Force. Every missile fired on the Marshall Islands by the US military costs $100 million each. This derelict school bus is the only one on eBay they can't afford to replace it. The base is not good for us. The people of Marshall Islands, we have no need for it. It's being used to test missiles to fire at countries like China. Yes, and anywhere else if they want to. What would you like to see happen there? <laughs> I want our land back. This is Shanghai, 
The historic port on the Yangtze River, China's greatest city. I had arranged to meet the American author James Bradley, whose latest best-selling book, The China Mirage, reveals an extraordinary hidden history of American power and modern China. It was almost illegal for someone like me to know a Chinese for almost all of American history. The Chinese came to America to mine gold and build the railroads, and Americans decided we didn't like the competition. So in 1882, we had the Chinese Exclusion Acts, which kept the Chinese out of the United States for about 100 years. So you have the largest population in the world that can't come to the United States. So at just the point we're putting up the Statue of Liberty saying we welcome everybody, we were erecting a wall saying we welcome everybody except those Chinese. Fear of a rising China today is the latest chapter in a history of propaganda that presented the Chinese as uncouth and infantile. To Western popular and political culture, the Chinese became the yellow peril, and racial stereotypes bore the constant theme of fear and threat. Boris Karloff as the evil Fu Manchu. His passion for power twisting his brilliant mind as he revels in the horrors of human sacrifice and torture. Behind the mask of Fu Manchu. This caricature of an entire people concealed another agenda, opium. For the American elite in the 19th century, China was a gold mine of drugs. Warren Delano, the grandfather of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was the American opium king of China. He was the biggest American opium dealer, second to the British. He welcomed the first American ship into China to help out with the opium wars. Uh, much of the east coast of America, Columbia, uh, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, uh, were born from uh, opium money. The American Industrial Revolution was funded by huge pools of money. Where did this come from? It came from illegal drugs in the biggest market in the world, China. Let me get this right. The grandfather of arguably the most liberal president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was a drug runner. Yes, sir. Franklin Delano Roosevelt never made much money in his life. He had public service jobs that were very lowly paid, but he had yachts, he had summer homes, he had mansions in New York City. The kids went to private schools. He inherited a fortune from Warren Delano, his father, who was the American opium king of China. If you scratch anyone with the name Forbes in, in their name, John uh, Forbes Carey, Secretary of State John Forbes Carey. That's the present Secretary of State. Yes, sir. You'll find opium money. His great-grandfather was an opium dealer. How big was opium money? Opium money built the first industrial city in the United States, Lowell, Massachusetts. It built the first five railroads in the United States. Opium money all over the East Coast, but it wasn't talked about. It was called the China trade. And if you go to various museums, you can see teas and silks uh, uh, exhibited, and they keep quiet about all that big opium money. In the scramble to get opium money, China was invaded and colonized by Britain and the other imperial powers. Foreign armies grabbed whole swathes of China this is the American army in Tiananmen Square, Peking, in 1900. Great cities like Shanghai were taken over and declared concessions, and foreigners lived a life of privilege and luxury amidst terrible poverty imposed on the Chinese. A 
resistance, known as the Boxer Rebellion, was put down with the savagery. This rape of China set the tone for how China was perceived in the West well into the 20th century. This is the distinguished historian Theodore H. White, an advisor to the White House, speaking in the 1960s. Perhaps China is too vast to be governed by mercy. Yet if Chinese mind craves order, they must be brought to recognize they are the biggest factor in the world's disorder. And we must untangle the madness of their mind. The most difficult task in the world is to reach the minds of men who hate you. What White was really complaining about was the loss of a China that the Imperial West could dominate and the defeat of General Chiang Kai-shek, who with his famously powerful Christian wife, Mei Ling Sung, guarded America's interests in China. That is, until they were thrown out in 1949 by a communist revolution led by Mao Zedong. Mao had beaten Chiang Kai-shek three times in huge battles involving millions of combatants. Mao was a winner in this contest from the early 1930s on, but we knew very little about it, and people don't understand that even today. Shanghai hears the message clearly as foreign businessmen board up their shops. Go now, go quickly, for communism marches. Take what you can, but flee. In pell-mell haste, the Western powers evacuate the city they have built, for good and bad alike must leave. The businessmen come for profit, as well as missionaries come to heal, must say goodbye, as out the Yangtze steams the last of Western influence, and farewell to a century. Even today, it's difficult to understand the paranoia ignited by Mao's revolution. As we look at China on the map, we can see that China is the basic cause of all of our troubles in Asia. I believe that for the sake of our safety, it is necessary to be prepared for the possibility of a Chinese missile attack on the United States. One of the myths about Mao is that he was an implacable enemy of the capitalist West. <laughs> Shanghai today is a prosperous international city still run by the communists, at least in name. When I was last in China more than a generation ago, the loudest noise was the tinkling of bicycle bells. Mao had just died, the streets were dark, the universities were closed. The chaos of the Cultural Revolution had given way to a great silence. We're exhausted, was the freest comment I heard. Coming back, the change is barely comprehensible. Here in Shanghai, the freedom bears no comparison. Yes, there are issues with human rights, especially the right to speak against the state and challenge its power. Since I was last here, millions of people have been lifted out of poverty, many of them into an entirely new middle class. This epic is still barely understood in the West, or should that be willfully misunderstood? The truth is that China has matched America at its own great game of capitalism, and that is unforgivable. One measure of China's new capitalism is the Uran Rich List. This league table of China's mega-rich is published by Rupert Hugenworth, an old Etonian whose Chinese name is Huron. 
he's received many awards, including China's Man of the Year. This year, 2015, has probably been the most extraordinary year of wealth creation in the history of China again. You know, in, I've been doing this list for 15, 16 years. I've never seen a year like 2015. You know, normally for 200 million pounds or 300 million dollars, uh, we find, say, about 800,000 people. This year, 2015, it's, it's doubled. There'll be more dollar billionaires known about in China than in the US. So the US, up until now, has been the leader in terms of business, and, uh, you know, the most successful business tycoons in the world. China, 2015, will have overtaken the US. So, amazing. Modern China is full of telling ironies, not least this museum that was once the house where Mao and his comrades secretly founded the Communist Party of China in 1921. Today it stands in the heart of an exclusive, very capitalist shopping district. When you leave the shrine to China's great revolution, you're confronted by a surreal spectacle. For right outside where the Chinese Communist Party was born are the very symbols of capitalism. Starbucks, Apple, Cartier, Dolce Cabana, and down there, perhaps the free market's greatest triumph, bottled water that ensures you live young, costing six pounds for a small bottle in my hotel. Would Mao spin in his tomb if he was here? I'm not so sure. Hidden history is always a key to the truth. Five years before his great communist revolution in 1949, Mao sent this secret message to Washington. China must industrialize, wrote Mao. This can only be done by free enterprise. Chinese and American interests fit together economically and politically. America need not fear that we will not be cooperative. We cannot risk crossing America. We cannot risk any conflict. Mao received no reply. Nothing has changed. Mao Zedong was looking to be a friend with the United States from the beginning. Mao says, I will go meet Franklin Roosevelt in the White House. Mao reaches out in 1950 to Harry Truman. He reaches out to Dwight Eisenhower. His hand was tossed away. This opportunity that might have changed history prevented wars, saved countless lives, was lost because the truth of Mao's overtures was denied in the Washington of the 1950s. State Department officials who had carried Mao's messages were condemned unjustly as communist traitors. Everybody who knew Mao, who spoke Chinese, was gone. In the 1950s, the State Department had no employees who spoke Chinese. It's resulted in us not having relations with the number one most populous country in the world. In 1979, this man, Deng Xiaoping, became China's paramount leader. He said, Socialism does not mean shared poverty. This was code for the most radical reform since Mao's revolution, the return of capitalism to China, but this time controlled by the Communist Party. To be rich is glorious, Deng was reported as saying, America was now threatened by the emergence of a vast image of itself. This is one of the many very exclusive gated communities in Shanghai, 
where an apartment is one of the prizes of the new communism. I had arranged to see Professor Zhang Wei Wei, a close aide to the late Deng Xiaoping, the man who changed China. Deng is um, uh, really extremely uh, long-term visionary, a leader with uh, exceedingly long-term uh, strategic vision for his country, uh, for his people. Yeah, China is mm. still following that path. Yeah. Actually, this is a really a tradition from China's yes. long history. You look at even like Mao, you know, he said, yeah. we should, you know, surpass UK uh, yeah. by which year, we should surpass the United States yes. by which year. So the tradition continues to this day. Even Xi Jinping today is also doing the same. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Actually, what many Chinese uh, have problem with Western media is the stereotypes about China. If you are, uh, you are uh, content with stereotypes, you miss so many things, you know. If BBC broadcasts something, they are happy to always mention this communist dictatorship, this autocracy. No, actually, with this kind of label, you know, you cannot understand this China as it is. But if you uh, watch BBC or CNN yes. or read Economist and try to understand China, it will be a failure. <laughs> it's impossible. Multiple parties fight for political power and everyone voting on them as the only path to salvation to the long-suffering developing world. This is world. Eric Lee, a Shanghai entrepreneur, educated in America, and typical of a failed. new, confident, outspoken time, political fire. class. Now in China, uh, there are a lot of problems. Uh, but at the moment, the Chinese, the party state, has proven an extraordinary ability to change. I mean, I make the joke how in America you can change political parties, but you can't change the policies. In China, you cannot change the party, but you can change policies. Uh, so in the 65 or 66 mm -hmm. years, China is being run by one single party, yet the, the political changes that have taken place in China in this past 66 years uh, have been wider and broader and greater than probably any other major country in modern memory. So in that time, China ceased to be communist. Is that what you're saying? Well, China is a market economy, and it's a vibrant market economy, but it is not a capitalist country. Here's why. There's no way a group of billionaires could control the Politburo, as billionaires control American policymaking. So in China, you have a vibrant market economy, but capital does not rise above political authority. Capital is not, does not have enshrined rights. In America, capital, the interest of capital and capital itself has risen above the, na the American nation. The political authority cannot check the power of capital. And that's why America is a capitalist country, but China is not. This is the ironic title of a best-selling book by Zhang Lijia, a journalist and critic who lives in Beijing. Many Americans imagine that the Chinese people live a miserable, repressed life with no freedom whatsoever. That's not quite true. If you talk, speak to many ordinary Chinese people, they will tell you they feel their life are quite free some 500 million people being lifted out of poverty, and some would say probably 600 million people. That's a, a great achievement. For many Americans, the yellow peril has never left them. Mm -hmm. I think the, there's a the fear about China. Of course, there's a the fear of China's rapid rise, but it also has a lot to do uh, with uh, China's uh, the label as a communist and state. China's objectives are modest compared with their weight. They're not trying to run the world. They're not even trying to run Asia Pacific. I think they want to keep America from dominating the Asia Pacific. So they have what they believe is their rightful place 
in Asia Pacific because of long civilization, long history, and their size. Um, so their objectives are really modest compared with their capacity. The the wealth, the new wealth in China. Mm-hmm. They often say this is this is the product of mm-hmm. self made entrepreneurial mm-hmm. skill. Yeah. But is it not also the product of the exploitation of people at the bottom. What are known in China as migrants, but they're not really migrants, they're Chinese. (laughs) If you really, you know, uh, go to talk to these migrant workers, uh, you will find quite surprisingly, over the past five to seven years, they have experienced uh, greater income increase than any other social groups. China is not a class society. But China is a class society. These are the homes of migrant workers, people who build and service the new China. Here, it's not uncommon for three families to share one tiny flat. You know, you would associate a socialist country with with equality, but uh, unfortunately, since the reform has started, China has become one of the most unequal societies in the world. The income gap is widening. Government, I feel, have retreated some of the responsibilities left the market to take over, but the market does not always treat women kindly. Some um, private companies, they would just refuse to hire um, child-bearing age women. And sometimes when women become pregnant, they will sack them because they don't want to pay the maternity leave. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the income gap has um, grown much bigger uh, between men and women. Your old boss, Tang Zeping presided over the bloodshed in Tiananmen mm-hmm. Square. What would you say to the survivors of Tiananmen Square? Because so many of those did fight mm-hmm. for what they saw mm-hmm. as democratic change in China. In 1989, there were two political forces. One was those represented by the Chinese students. Their hero was Mihai Gorbachev, who happened to be in Beijing. Mm -hmm. Their slogan was, Soviet Union's today, China's tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So the idea was political reform first, other reform second. Otherwise, China would be hopeless. And Deng's message was the opposite. He thought Gorbachev was an idiot. He thought, you know, China must have economic reform first, other reform second. This priority must be set clearly. Unfortunately, at that particular moment in 1989, the two political forces could not reach a compromise. So definitely a tragedy occurred, yeah. It was more than a tragedy, it was a massacre, of which the memory remains a raw presence in modern China. Why does the Chinese state still fear the few, the few who speak out? And I'm thinking of... Mm. Liu Xiaobo. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, this man won the Nobel Peace Prize, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he's in prison. He's violating the Chinese law, you know, by a big margin. So, uh, actually, the freedom of expression, similar views are aired by many people but he's really going to the extreme. Liu Xiaopo challenged the government to implement democratic reforms and has spent a total of 13 years in prison. Why can't a confident China accept a criticism like this? So, Nobel Peace Committee makes huge mistake. They owe the Chinese an explanation. If you cross the line, of course, you violate the Constitution, you violate so many laws, you should be punished. And yet in China today, the spirit of protest and dissent lives on in different forms. In 2015, 
strikes and community protests and activism reached record levels. This resistance is seldom reported in the West. So there are lots of protests in China. Uh, typically, for example, land being grabbed by officials to, for commercial development, and the farmers are not being compensated properly. Yeah. But the farmers now know more aware of their rights, so they protest. Or young workers from the factory, they demand a better wage or better, mm. better working condition. But many of the protests, they are economic driven, yeah. not political driven. They are regional, not national wide. So this kind of things will unlikely develop into a real movement or so-called, you call that revolution. Yeah. Okay. So the Mao's revolution was the last revolution. <laughs> well, I never say never. <laughs> <laughs> The Japanese island of Okinawa is occupied by 32 military installations. From here, the United States has attacked Korea, Vietnam, Cambodia, Afghanistan, Iraq. The sky is full of planes and helicopters. Wherever people go, they are fenced in and told to keep out. Okinawa is the front line of a beckoning war with China. Aged 87, Fumiko Shimabukuro is one of the leaders of a non-violent resistance that's challenging Washington's pivot to Asia. で、<笑><笑><笑> Fumiko is a survivor. A quarter of the civilians on the island were killed in the American invasion in 1945, and a fear of war has been passed through the generations. Today, those who witness these horrors live in a place of extraordinary beauty, surrounded by coral reefs and a unique marine life. It was here in Hinoko Bay that the survivors of World War II sought refuge. And it's this they're now fighting to save. It's an epic struggle that pits these island people against the greatest military power on Earth. This is the office of a former governor of Okinawa, Oto Masahide. What he has done is create not so much a museum, but an appeal to the outside world to understand the resistance in Okinawa, to understand the suffering, to read its hidden history. It begins in 1945 when the Americans invaded. Here is General MacArthur arriving in Okinawa. 
A second invasion happened ten years later in what became known as the Bulldozers and Bayonets Campaign. American forces seized prime agricultural land, burned farmhouses, and killed livestock. The dispossessed people of Okinawa marched the length of Japan, appealing for help. This wall is devoted to a resistance in Okinawa that never ceases. Everywhere people go on the island, they are confronted by this sign. It tells them they must not go past this fence topped with barbed wire. These fences run like great ribbons across the island, and the bases themselves cut swathes across Okinawa. But all around them are people with this continuing demonstration, this continuing resistance. And they have a message. It's people of the world. Watch what Japan and the US are doing. Don't let them force the bases on Okinawa. So, Okinawa has been doing this for a long time. The people who have been doing this for a long time have been doing this for a long time. The people who have been doing this for a long time have been doing this for a long time. The people who have been doing this for a long time have been doing this for a long time. いますまあだからそこにここに呪言の保護区を作るためにはここに基地があったらできませんだからその基地はですねここが持たらされてくるという民話がありますでその民話の中に呪言がですね似合いかないの幸からその幸を似合いかないからその死者をですね呪が寄
threat of these low-flying aircraft is a constant presence in Okinawa. Teachers often can't teach because of the noise and the fear. This was the carnage when an American fighter crashed into a primary school after the pilot had ejected to safety. Haru Akira, aged seven, was terribly burned. This was at a メソッドだったから。ましたさんがな、その方がいしかに教授って言ったけど、ちてますので、宮本にこう行ったんだけど、どこにいるかわからなかったんです。その当時。それであの人から明くんは病院、総合病院に行ったよという、あの人が明らか
One of the American servicemen, whose job was to fire the MACE missiles, has since revealed that China was a nuclear target during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. We were told that we had to launch all the missiles, but we only had one missile headed towards Russia, and we did not see why we should have to involve the other countries. The captain suggested that uh, everybody crack the doors open, so it would take less time to launch a missile if the doors were cracked open. One of the launch crews was on the point of firing their missiles when a duty officer suspected the order was false. The launch officer on the B side was told to send two men over there with 45s and to shoot anybody that tried to launch until the situation was resolved. And it would only take like 15, 20 seconds to run the distance between the, the two uh, command centers. So those two men kept that whole crew at bay uh, while we made a decision as to what to do. And it wasn't very long, maybe two or three seconds later, where a very nervous major came over the intercom uh, issuing the uh, stand down order and then we just kind of looked at each other like we could have exterminated the whole planet the major who had given the launch order was quietly court-martialed and dismissed from the air force that morning is just as familiar to me and as clear as yesterday morning is and this is 53 years later, and how clear blue the sky was, and it was just some very light clouds, and the, there was a perfect breeze blowing, and a perfect temperature. I did not know what the temperature was, but it just felt perfect. And we were all just kind of taking it in, and taking in the smell of the air, and the sea, and the land mixture together, and everything smelled so beautiful. This is very interesting, because it shows the cities mm -hmm. in China right. where these MACE missiles were which, aimed at. Yes. Which, which ones do we have here? This is Okinawa Island. So uh, within 2,000 kilometers, you find Peking or Beijing, Xi'an, UK, and Hong Kong, Shanghai, tai, uh, it's Taiwan, Taipei, and uh, Pyongyang, North Korea, within the range of missile. This is the work of the Okinawan sculptor Kinjo Minoru. It's a tribute to the suffering and resistance of the people of this island. than a thousand miles away on the Korean island of Jeju, these symbols of struggle are hauntingly similar. The work of Korean sculptor Ko Gilchun represents another fight of island people for freedom. semi-tropical sanctuary of unusual beauty, Jeju Island is a World Heritage Site. The government of South Korea declared it an island of world peace.
But on this island of peace has been built one of the most provocative military bases in the world, less than 400 miles from Shanghai. Like Okinawa and the Marshall Islands, this is America's front line in its so-called pivot to Asia. Here in once unspoiled Ganjung village, the South Korean Navy has built a base for American aircraft carriers, nuclear submarines, and destroyers equipped with the Aegis ballistic missile aimed at China's defenses. China's lifelines to the world in oil, trade, resources depend on shipping that comes through choke points like this. The U.S. pivot into the Asia-Pacific is really intended to create the ability to put a loaded gun to the head of China and say, you know, uh, you will do as we say, otherwise we will be able to restrict, we will be able to shut down, choke off your importation of oil and other resources. For nine years, every day, often twice a day, these Catholic priests have staged a mass that blocks the gates of the new military base on Jeju Island. In a country where political demonstrations can be easily banned, unlike powerful religions, the tactic has produced this spectacle of resistance. Father Moon Jong Hoon has led the fight to stop the base being built and several times suffered serious injury. I sing four songs every day, before Mass, during the Mass, at the end of the Mass, and uh, the end of the Rosary. Yeah. Uh, the, the content of the song is very beautiful. <laughs> the, the writer and the composer is uh, the musician from this island. Oh. So I love oh. him very much, oh. and he gave me the song oh. that I practice. And I became a master to sing that song because I practice every day. Well, you, you sing it with such <laughs> passion. <laughs> Sometimes we just wait. Typhoon, you know, typhoon <laughs> strike. <laughs> do you sing then? Do you, do you have a mass when the typhoon strike? Oh, yes. During this. No exception. What will happen if this base becomes operational? They have uh, destroyed the environment, destroyed the life of villages. No, we should be witness of that uh, oppression and mm. violence, you know. Why do they do it? Well, they'd like to rule the Pacific area, whole area, right? They'd like to make China isolated in this globe. Yeah. You know? It means U.S. government want to be emperor of this world. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, a Quaker called Mr. O joins them with his own ritual of protest, accompanied by an artist called Wildflower. Oh, 
산부위배를 하다 보면 이렇게 바닥에 숙여야 되잖아요. 그 차들이 올때못볼수 있어요. 매우 위험하죠. 그래서 제가 뒤에서 좀 눈에 띄게 이렇게 하고 있으면 그런 교통사고를 막을 수도 있고요. 저도 제 바느질이 명상이라고 생각하거든요. 어, 실제로 그 뇌파가 명상할 때 거의 비슷해요. 바느질 할 때. 저는 저거, 저 해군기지가 명백하게 미국의 전쟁기지라 생각해요. 그래서 배치와 더불어서 어, 우리나라 한반도 남쪽, 전쪽, 서쪽, 서쪽으로 미군기지가 들어있어요. 그래서 저는 이 제주가 마지막 이 섬, 섬, 이 서해안 쪽으로 전쟁 벨트를 지었는데 그 벨트의 맨 마지막이라 생각을 해요. 그 당연히 이거는 중국이 겨냥하고 있기 때문에 중국과의 분쟁 또는 동, 이쪽 동북아의 평화를 정말 위협할 수 있는 그런 기지라서 이게 가장 큰 위험이라고 생각을 해요. 4,000 The archipelago of empire, uh, the bases that we have around the world, hidden in plain sight, are the, the real territory of our empire. Uh, but at the same time, we maintain independent governments in Japan or South Korea or Germany. Uh, they don't have autonomy when it comes to foreign policy. So it's a very sophisticated and effective system uh, where, whereby we pat ourselves on the back for uh, helping to midwife uh, democracy in Japan and Germany and South Korea and various other places, while keeping the lid on uh, in, in that we don't know what these countries would do if they were fully independent. And, and the beauty of this system is that most people pay no attention to it at all. They think it's just a natural occurrence to have uh, 50,000 American troops in, in Japan. The, there's no country that has better anti-imperial credit uh, cred than uh, the United States, and we are not trying to recreate the glories of the uh, the British Empire. We're arguing that the world is round. We have a global policy, and all nations have global rights. No ocean has ever been dominated the way the U.S. dominates the Pacific. Navy and Air Force, uh, they claim at, in the uh, Pearl Harbor headquarters of the uh, Pacific Command, they claim to be responsible for 52% of the Earth's uh, surface. And when you look at their uh, logo, it shows uh, an eagle over the Aleutian Islands with one tail on coming down somewhere near Seattle and the other coming down right over Beijing. So uh, Beijing uh, looks at a network of bases, a real archipelago of empire that's been built up since the Korean War. You have had, and still have, an arc of, of bases that start in Australia and go through the no. Pacific. We have no bases in Australia. You have Pine Gap, you have Darwin, and you no. have a new facility in Western Australia. No, uh, to speak precisely, we, we have no military bases in Australia. What we do is uh, operate with and in Australian bases, yeah. but we're not in the basing business nowadays. There's a growing collection of what are referred to as lily pad bases. Mm. Um, these are bases that have typically two, three hundred troops, um, no family members, very few amenities and are often quite secretive. They're bases that are frequently constructed within 
a foreign country's base to disguise it, um, and, and generally are not referred to as bases. Many of these bases have been set up to combat China's worldwide economic influence. From these bases, the United States operates a secret army in 147 countries. If you're going to be a free country rather than give in to every gangster regime in the world, you're going to have to take a risk because those gangsters, they want to they, they want to eliminate good people in the world That's so true. they can, uh, uh, and, and in China, they want to dominate all of, the, all of the Far East. They want to dominate, just like Japan wanted to before World War II, their goal was to dominate that part of the world. Today, the, because there has been no political reform in Beijing, these guys want to dominate a huge chunk of the planet. Twilight struggle. Andrew Kropenovich served on America's National CIA Defense Panel. He's a military strategist and war planner. You've written that airstrikes and naval blockades have a, a role to play in punishing China. You've described the need for sea mines. You've described the need for special forces, U.S. special forces, and missiles placed in islands. This sounds like a preparation for war. Um, our, our first president, George Washington, said, if you want peace, prepare for war. And essentially, uh, what the United States is doing, again, is responding to provocative behavior uh, on the part of China. And just as we did in the Cold War, the idea was uh, to have a position of military strength such that your adversaries were not tempted to act uh, in aggressive ways or try and employ coercion to get their way. I mean, just last week, the U.S. Navy sent a guided missile destroyer into the mm -hmm. Spratly Islands and South China Sea. And what was different about this, I think, was that Chinese fighters scrambled. That sounds like an escalator. Well, the, uh, again, from an American perspective, the, the escalation was the Chinese beginning to militarize these islands in the first place, uh, moving uh, its military capabilities down into that region, uh, engaging in provocative behavior against uh, the commercial activities and, and military um, forces of, of other minor countries in the region that have claim to those islands. Mm -hmm. So it's a response to Chinese intimidation. Uh, rather, uh, excuse me, how, how is commerce being intimidated in the South China Sea? There have been no military mm. forces, no military bases there. Uh, the Chinese... Except the United States military base. Not in the South China Sea, and not even in, in the Philippines, in, in, because the United States withdrew its forces in the Philippines. But the United States is back in the Philippines. The Philippines and the United States have announced five different locations scattered all throughout the Philippines where U.S. troops will be stationed on a rotational basis. This threat to China from yet more U.S. bases on its doorstep was not an issue when an arbitration tribunal ruled against China's claims to the strategic Spratly Islands in the South China Sea. In 2015, the U.S. Navy rehearsed a blockade that would cut China's lifelines of oil and trade and raw materials. The danger of confrontation grows by the day. The US Navy is on the doorstep of China, regardless of disputed islands, and is there with low draft ships, planes, mm -hmm. battle groups. It's right on the doorstep. What if Chinese ships, what if the equivalent was off California? Well, John, we ask ourselves that question regularly, and it's, it's important to put yourself in the other guy's shoes. Yeah. Uh, so, look, we don't operate in the Pacific in an effort to scare China, to contain China, to backfoot China. Our operations uh, and our presence it, first of all, is warmly welcomed by the vast majority of the coastal states. But secondly, is fully accepted by the Chinese. Time after time... Is it, excuse me, is it fully accepted? Yes. My impression... By their, by their words. The Chinese My impression leaders, is that they're scared. And this is what they're scared of 
a noose of bases right around China. Missiles, bombers, drones, warships, a provocation of war. Today, I state clearly and with conviction, America's commitment to seek the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. Under Obama, nuclear warhead spending has risen higher than under any president since the end of the Cold War. It's all a magician's show because at the same time that Obama is talking about that, not only is he spending a trillion dollars to modernize U.S. nuclear forces, but he's deploying these missile defense systems to encircle Russia and China, which makes it impossible to get rid of nuclear weapons in that climate. Everybody wants to look like they're tough. See, I got to be tough. I got to show you, I, you know, I'm not afraid of doing anything military. I'm not afraid of threatening. I'm, you know, I'm a hairy chested gorilla. And, uh, you know, and you don't want to look like you're weak. So what you do is you talk more and more aggressively and, uh, and you let, and if you don't want to do it yourself, because you maybe think it doesn't look very presidential, you let somebody under you do the talking. And we have gotten into a state, the United States has gotten into a situation where there's a lot of military, uh, you know, saber rattling. Yeah. And it's really being orchestrated from the top. Yeah. This seems incredibly dangerous, all of this. That's an understatement, I think, but I agree. Yeah. <laughs> when you routinely plan for mass murder, you become conditioned to it. That's what this is. We accept it. Oh yeah, we have, we have nuclear weapons. The Defense Secretary, he's just announced that there will be warships and special forces and planes sent to the Philippines. And the Wall Street Journal has described this as the vanguard of a major U.S. presence in Southeast Asia. That sounds like... Where does this end? What's the, what's the purpose? I mean, where are we going to stop this process before it starts a war? And then if the war starts, where does that end? The scientific studies that I teach by the scientists that predict that the Earth can be made essentially uninhabitable from nuclear war, the scientists have been begging the Obama administration, well, they wouldn't say begging, but they've made multiple requests to meet with them and discuss these predictions because they're peer-reviewed studies and they've been turned down over and over again. They've been peripherally told that, well, we don't think uh, the long-term environmental consequences of nuclear war are all that important if the immediate effects of nuclear war don't stop it. But the long-term environmental consequences of nuclear war are liable to wipe out the human race. In one exchange, nuclear exchange between the U.S. and China, what could be the consequences? Well, let me just give you an example of what one Chinese four or five megaton warhead would do to a city in the United States. If it got through, uh, the detonation of that weapon over a city would instantly ignite about six or seven hundred square miles on fire. And, and within 20 to 30 minutes, all of those fires would coalesce into a single gigantic firestorm. There would be no escape from it, so all the people there would perish. So the U.S. with, say, hundreds of nuclear weapons on Chinese cities. Well, when you combine all the smoke from these nuclear weapons detonating. It actually creates millions of tons of smoke, black carbon smoke, will rise above cloud level into the stratosphere. It's heated by the sun, it acts like a solar collector. And that smoke, because of that, will stay there for 10 years or longer. And what the smoke does is it blocks warming sunlight from reaching the surface of the earth. And it becomes so cold 
in a matter of just a couple of weeks that will, the temperatures will fall below freezing every day for one to three years. And it will become too cold to grow food crops for at least 10 years or longer. I mean, there's, there's like a total disconnect with the changing world. You have a giant rising power, in this case, China. Why would you expect a giant rising power to not want to have more control over its destiny? What we should be doing, in my view, is trying to cultivate a sense of uh, friendship and cooperation, and we can have our differences with them. If we think they're doing something in trade that we don't like, let's have it out with them. But this saber-rattling is the worst thing we can possibly do. to show the whole world that America is back, bigger and better and stronger than ever before. We don't have victories anymore. We used to have victories, but we don't have them. When was the last time anybody saw us beating, let's say, China in a trade deal? They kill us. We can't continue to allow China to rape our country, and that's what they're doing. It's the greatest theft in the history of the world. The new president, Donald Trump, has a problem with China. The urgent question now is, will Trump continue with the provocations revealed in this film and take us all to the edge? of war. There never have been two countries more interdependent on each other than China and the U.S. in history. Uh, and China is the largest trading nation in the world and in history. So China's economy and, and, and their society and their lives are, 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 are linked to the entire world including America and the West and, and all the other countries. So, so I think interdependence between these two countries and among all the nations of the world um, speak to peace. We don't have to accept the word of those who conjure up threats and false enemies that justify the business and profit of war if we recognize there is another superpower. And that's us. Ordinary people everywhere, like the people of Okinawa, Jeju Island, the Marshall Islands, China, the United States. By speaking out, they deliver a warning to all of us. Can we really afford to be silent? We'll meet again Don't know where Don't know where but I know we'll meet again some sunny day. Keep smiling through just like you always do till the blue skies drive the dark clouds far away. So will you please say hello to the folks that I know Tell them I won't be long They'll be happy to know that as you saw me go I was singing this song We meet again 
don't know where, don't know when, but I know we'll meet again some sunny day.